Welcome to part two of High Renaissance Painting in Italy. What you're looking at now are two um, drawings or cartoons, um, one done by Leonardo da Vinci and the other done by Raphael, who is um, our next High Renaissance artist that we'll be discussing. So while both Leonardo and Raphael were um, High Renaissance artists, um, and they share some characteristics. They also had some major differences. So I want you to look and compare and contrast the sketches um, from each artist. And which one do you think would have been easier to transfer um, to the attended um, surface or substrate? So remember, Leonardo would actually, and, and this would happen too with Raphael's um, drawings, to transfer the sketch onto the intended surface, they would poke small holes um, and blow chalk um, through them to sort of um, transfer the image. So which one do you think would have been easier um, to do that technique with? Okay, hopefully you thought about it. If you said Raphael, you are correct. When we compare Raphael's drawing to Leonardo's, we see that he has a much more linear style. Remember I talked about Leonardo's style as being more um, characteristic of a technique called sfumato, um, where he had these very velvety, shadowy edges, um, and it it really looked very smoke-like. Um, and so there's really not a definite linear um, composition happening. So Leonardo was in fact a little bit unusual. Um, he's, he is considered a high renaissance painter, but he was a little bit different than um, some of the other high renaissance painters that we will be discussing, Raphael and Michelangelo, who did have more of a linear um, approach um, to their painting style. So here we're looking at a, a painting done by Raphael um, called the Small Cowper Madonna. This isn't one that you have to know, but I'm using it to introduce the painting style of um, Raphael. So um, note um, the, the monumental sort of figures placed in the foreground. And also this use of the pyramidal figures, this sort of triangular composition um, that also Leonardo incorporated into his, into his painting style. Um, the low-lying landscape, um, there's a sense of more direct and brighter light that can be observed and recorded. And so these characteristics do typically characterize the 15th century high Renaissance painting. So this is a definitely more linear design where you have um, brighter colors, um, the shape is more defined, um, and you do have this um, pyramidal um, composition in terms of how the figures are laid out. So it is very balanced and symmetrical in a lot of ways like um, Leonardo's um, composition. Um, of his version of um, the Virgin. But again, it's basically the style of, you know, here he uses the sfumato and you have these very undefined edges and you don't really have any lines. And here with Raphael, you definitely do um, have that distinction. Like Leonardo, he, he did, Raphael did incorporate pyramidal forms as well as oval forms. And so um, he also incorporated the three-quarter view um, as well in his composition. Sorry, so here you can sort of compare and contrast um, the, the pyramidal and, and oval forms that both artists use. Um, the portrait that Raphael created also serves as a landscape portrait of the artist's hometown. So in the landscape, we see the church depicted and he is using this as a device to make the viewer feel more familiar with the portrait. Um, we also saw this um, with some of the early, some of the um, earlier um, North European um, Renaissance um, altarpieces, like the Marode altarpiece, where they had the Annunciation scene depicted in um, a contemporary um, 15th century living room in North Europe. Um, so again, the Renaissance is really characterized by this, this sort of need to um, not be so overwhelming in terms of um, expressing religion and overpowering the worshiper, but actually trying to make them feel more comfortable um, and relate more um, um, to, to the religious narrative that's being presented. 
Raphael balances composition um, both horizontally and vertically. Um, and again, this is something very typical of um, high Renaissance compositions. The use of atmospheric perspective near the horizon is also incorporated. So atmospheric perspective is a term that you should be familiar with where things um, in the foreground are clearer and more distinct and as they um, move into the background they become less defined. And this is also sort of a scientific observation that when we you know, look out on a landscape we, we do see this phenomenon occur. He incorporates a blue-gray color um, at this um, a blue-gray color and it kind of forms a line that hits right at her shoulders. And this really allows for more emphasis to be placed on the head, um, which contrasts with this bright blue sky. So he's purposely um, making his horizon line lower um, because if he actually made it higher, he would lose the emphasis um, on her head um, and the, also the face of um, the figure of Jesus. Here's another comparison between um, Leonardo's um, version of the Madonna and Raphael. So Spumato was not a popular convention in the High Renaissance, so I want to make that clear. This is very, um, this is only a characteristic really associated with Leonardo. So he's a High Renaissance artist, but he was different in, in that technique of Spumato. High Renaissance artists were um, usually preferred clarity and crisp lines, um, sort of the act of drawing. Um, Disagnal, D-I-S-E-G-N-O-L, um, was a term used during the 16th and 17th centuries to designate um, the formal discipline required for the representation of the ideal form of an object in the visual arts. Um, especially as expressed in the linear structure of a work of art. So drawing outline forms first and then adding color um, would have been the technique that most high Renaissance artists would have used. So they actually would have drawn more of an outline um, and maybe filled in more with color, where remember with Leonardo, he would sort of start um, with this kind of mass of pigment or color or value and and sort of um, kind of move from from dark to light. Um, it's a much different style. Some other characteristics to note that we, we, we started to see um, with the early Renaissance. Um, remember Fra Filippo Lipe's depiction of the Madonna. Um, the baby is definitely more natural um, and looks like a baby, a chubby little baby. And he's acting like a baby, sort of trying to climb up on his mother. And he's, he's doing what real babies do. And so, again, this is more of this infusion of um, a divine subject, but um, presenting it as more familiar and everyday to the, to the viewer. Raphael creates an oval composition that enhances the intimacy between um, the mother and child. Um, the mother wears a blue-red gown that is traditional for the virgin. Um, and he does not incorporate chiaroscuro, um, and he really embraces more of this very linear type of drawing. So here you can sort of see this sort of oval composition um, between um, the mother and the baby Jesus, um, and, and it, it does unify um, the two figures more. Um, also note how Mary's expression is sad, um, and so this is, um, I have your sorry about that. So her sad expression um, has been interpreted by art historians that she has knowledge of her son's death, and so it, it is different. She's not even looking at him. They don't have that connection or gaze. Um, their intimacy is more um, based on their embrace and their, and their proximity to each other. Um, all right, so we're going to move on um, to a, a fresco um, done by Raphael. So the Madonnas, you don't, both for Leonardo and Raphael, are not official works on the AP College Board list. Um, the Last Supper is, and then um, this, this fresco done by Raphael called the Stanza della Signatura, um, which was commissioned by Pope Julius II. Um, and 1509 is one that you do have to know. So we're going to be looking um, 
in depth over here um, at this fresco here. Um, so again, um, this is also a period where um, you have these sort of emperor popes um, who were in control um, and were very integral in commissioning arts, especially um, huge art projects and sort of public or civic works of art. Um, and so Pope Julius II was a, a, an important patron in that sense during the High Renaissance. Um, he also employed Michelangelo as well, so you'll we'll hear a little bit more about him. So the Stanza della Signa Signatore, or it's in, and it translates the Room of Signatures, um, was um, a room um, that contained a library, and this was the room where the Pope signed important documents into law. So this is the, the painting that we're going to be looking at. Um, and so some things that are important and that stick out when you look at this are philosophy and theology. Um, and, um, and this idea of reconciling ancient pagan philosophy with Christian beliefs and practices. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit more in depth. Raphael was only 27 years old when he painted this, so I also wanted to point that out, that in the incredible skill and, and how young and um, sophisticated he was as an artist. So um, the title, the official title of the work is um, um, School of Athens. Um, it, again, it was done between 1509 and 1511. <clears throat> and what you see here, and we're going to go through and look at some of the individuals depicted here, are these sort of ancient um, Greek philosophers and mathematicians. Um, and so what's happening here is that there's an acknowledgement that Christianity was built on the soldiers, so, sorry, shoulders of this sort of ancient pagan um, knowledge um, that we inherited from Greek culture. Prior to this, remember, the church did not want anything to do with pagan philosophy. And this really... Um, we see this predominantly um, in the early medieval period. And so this really does signal an important shift. Um, some characteristics that hopefully you have noted, um, Raphael incorporates a pyramidal composition. Um, you can see that in some of the grouping of the figures. And also his use of one-point perspective or linear one-point perspective. And then also the use of that disagonal painting style or that, you know, this, that style that really focused on linear and lines and sort of filling in those, those outline forms with color afterwards um, is another characteristic, a high renaissance painting characteristic. Note the, how the recessed um, sort of barrel vault architecture gives a sense of deep space as well as directing um, our attention to the figures in the center of the composition. Um, and these figures are Plato and Aristotle. Um, and, and so, again, even though this is a, a religious painting and it was commissioned by the Pope, um, it does signal, it really does signal the, that this is an intelligent subject matter. Okay, so I'm going to zero in on the two figures of Plato and Aristotle. And they represent two different ways of seeing the world. Um, Plato is, is depicted pointing up, um, signaling that he is interested in the spiritual world and transcendence, the world we can't see. Aristotle, if you notice over here, is gesturing, gesturing his palm downward toward the ground, signaling the tangible, the physical world, the use of empirical evidence and observation, the world we can see. So Plato and Aristotle represent um, principal philosophers to which everything descends. So this really goes back to this notion of divinity, but also um, people being interested in their life on earth and humanism and, you know, scientific observation and that all of this um, can be combined together and unified um, and appreciated. Um, looking at another detail of the composition, Again, we see that it's it's very balanced, and there is this um, actual implied horizontal and vertical line um, 
that are indicated. So when we look here, we definitely see this horizontal line with the alignment of the heads of um, these various um, philosophers. Um, and this is called isophily, isocephaly, <laughs> um, which is a, a term, it's spelled I. S O S C sorry I S O C E F I am so sorry I'm, I can't spell I S O C E P H A L Y and this is having the heads of the principal figures all at the same level um, and so this really creates an implied um, horizontal line or horizon line um, and and the term comes from um, Greek um, ISO Kalephos, like-headed from Isos, equal, and then, um, anyway, just know the term. <laughs> um, and then you definitely can see the, the hor I mean, you have the horizontal, but you also have these vertical um, lines um, depicted within the architecture. Also, we see references um, to pagan gods and goddesses. We have um, the depiction of the god Apollo over here and then Minerva over here into these architectural niches. So again, you know, this is very much alluding back to classical Greco-Roman um, concepts and ideas and very unusual in a, in a religious painting like this. So um, all of these different philosophers and scientists and mathematicians are depicted. Um, and I have, uh, in your actual lecture notes that will be available to you, I have um, the number corresponding to the philosopher um, or mathematician or scientist that they're supposed to represent. Um, so number 13 is interesting. We'll probably look more about this. This is actually supposed to represent the mathematician Her Heraclitus, Clatus. Um, but also, it's also a self-portrait of Michelangelo. So Michelangelo was actually um, working and working on another art project um, for Pope Julius II. And so Raphael um, did know Michelangelo and probably got to know him a little bit. And so he, he did sort of include these portraits of these sort of contemporary artists that he was friends with. Um, but they, you know, are representing um, these um, philosophers and these, you know, these Greek philosophers that actually made it possible um, or sort of paved the way um, for their Renaissance um, ideas. But you can go back and look at that on your own. And I do suggest that you do take the time oops, when I when I do give you um, the lecture notes to kind of see um, who these different um, philosophers and scientists are. So here's a better detail of, of, of this figure. So again, this is figure 13 that I, I showed you on my diagram. And it depicts a man in a short robe and boots it is thought to be Heraclitus, um, and he, which is from the Lonely Light, um, Heraclitus, um, and he was a philosopher um, that really stressed um, the ideas of unconsciousness, of humankind. Um, he really had this sort of obscure philosophy. Um, it's, it's kind of weird. <laughs> I thought he was a mathematician. I'm sorry. Um, but he was, he was definitely some sort of philosopher. He was known as the weeping philosopher. Um, and the nature of his philosophy and his stress upon the needless unconsciousness of humankind was something that led to him being called the obscure and the weeping philosopher. So that's why he's depicted as sort of sitting away from the other philosophers and sort of by himself, and you know, he seems a little bit antisocial. Um, Heraclitus is famous for um, his insistence on ever present change in the universe, as stated in the famous saying, no man ever steps in the same river twice. And he felt that time was in flux and that life never repeated. The likeness of Heracl Heraclitus 
is thought to be a portrait of Michelangelo, um, who was painting the Sistine Chapel at the time. So we will be looking at that um, project that was also commissioned by Julius, um, Pope Julius II. The figures look very massive and powerful, um, and again, have a very similar type of figure, figures Michelangelo would become famous for painting. Um, so this is something, um, obviously, that um, is important to, to note that fig, you know, other artists were influenced by other artists. Um, it also depicts him writing, and so Michelangelo was also a Renaissance man. He was also uh, a great poet and was said to be a very good poet as well. Another figure that we're going to talk a little bit more in depth, this is number six on that earlier diagram I showed you, um, is, is Pythagoras. Um, he's depicted in pink and white robes. Um, he is very influential um, in his contributions to philosophy and religion. Um, he's often referred to, that's why I thought, I got them confused, that's why I thought um, Heraclitus was a, was a mathematician. Um, Pythagoras um, was a great mathematician. He was also a mystic and a scientist, but he's best known for his Pythag Pythagorean theorem, which bears his name. His application of mathematics um, to music is well known. According to the legend, the way Pythagoras discovered that musical notes could be translated into mathematical equations was when he passed um, blacksmiths at work one day and thought the sounds emanating from um, their their anvils, I guess these were tools, were beautiful and harmonious and dedicated and decided that whatever scientific law caused this to happen must be mathematical and could be applied to music. And so the figure of Pythagoras represents how harmony relates to music and numbers, um, a mathematical and rational structure. Um, and so Pythagoras also elaborated on a theory of numbers, the exact meaning of which is still debated among scholars. Another belief attributed to Pythagoras was that of the harmony of spheres. Thus, the planets and stars moved according to mathematical equations, which corresponded to musical notes and thus produced a symphony. The figure of Path um, Pythagoras represents the idea of what beauty is and how it relates to harmony which become a very high Renaissance idea. So this is, this is why I really focused in on this figure. So he really culminates what um, the high Renaissance um, will be about. So here on this group, this is another figure that you should pay attention to. This is the figure of Euclid. He was a Greek mathematician. Um, he's referred to as the father of geometry. Um, and notice how he's in the act of teaching. Um, and then, and so again, this idea of education, um, a liberal education, you know, the liberal arts, I think, is, is very much apparent, um, you know, in this depiction. In the top right corner, um, there is a portrait of Raphael. Let me see if I can... I'm not sure which one it is. I think it might be this figure here. Um, and this is supposed to be a, a self-portrait that um, he inserted. Um, and it's directly looking at us. Um, and observe how, the, you know, and, and this is kind of cute and funny and, and you know, including these sort of self, these portraits of um, his colleagues and friends and also this self-portrait. Um, and then... You know, some other things to note about the figures, again, they're solid, they're, you know, anatomically correct, but also like Leonardo in The Last Supper, they really do interact and engage with each other. And there's a fluidity about it. It's not stiff, it's not formal, um, there's an informalness um, about it um, um, that is characteristic of the High Renaissance. So the overall composition is quite complex, both in structure and theme. All figures are great thinkers. Um, figures are, are almost divided in half, with the figures on the side of Plato representing mostly mathematics, you know, not trying to explain the actual world. And then the figures 
on the side of Aristotle represents science, scientist, and you know, scientists usually observe the actual physical world. Um, the grand architecture elevates and ennobles the figures as well. It speaks to their achievements of their mind, and that man is capable of divine status. So that is the message here. And so the painting represents a very short moment where classical ideas and religion merge together. But soon the Reformation will happen, and we did talk a little bit about that in the North um, European Renaissance. Um, I started talking about um, 15th century, and also I moved into the 16th century um, with Lu um, Lucius Chronic, the elder, um, and his um, painting of of um, the gospel and law. Um, so, so that's a product of the Reformation. So this is right before the Reformation. Um, and so there, there will be a move away from sort of classical ideas associated with, the, you know, within a religious context. So this concludes um, this subunit. Um, and please take time also to make sure you read over your handout, that overview I gave you about the High Renaissance, and make sure that you're able to sort of define and list these characteristics associated, you know, stylistic conventions and characteristics associated with the High Renaissance. Um, and also, please take time to look at the videos that I've uploaded in your resource folder, um, the, the Khan Academy videos. Um, there's one for The Last Supper the, um, by Leonardo, and there's one for the School of Athens, um, Raphael. And, I, you know, they're not too long, and I, I think it will help reinforce a lot of this information that we've gone over. See you soon.